Good morning, everyone. Um, we will go ahead and get started in just a second. As usual, there are handouts in the back, uh, so if you haven't had a chance to pick one up, you might want to do that. And um, I will go ahead and pray for us in just a second, and then we'll get started with week two of Made in the Image of God. I'll also say, uh, to begin with, that uh, you may want to turn in your Bibles um, to Genesis 1. We'll be looking uh, at various parts of Genesis 1 and 2 this morning. So let me go ahead and pray for us, and then we'll jump in for the day. Lord God, we thank you for your scriptures again, and we thank you for the truth that you are our creator and that you have made us in your image. As we look at your word in Genesis 1 and 2 this morning, we ask that you would help us to understand your word rightly, that you would help us to interpret it well, and that you would help us to grasp uh, all that it means to be made in your image and leave this place more uh, able to uh, reflect your image well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, okay, so to begin with, uh, let me go ahead and recap a little bit of what we talked about last week. Nathaniel, if you can, thank you. Um, so last week, we saw just by way of introduction that uh, at least one thing that it means to be made in the image of God is fundamentally that we, uh, that we reflect God. We, we mirror him within creation. Um, by the same token, this means that we derive our basic identity, uh, our purpose, and our meaning from God himself, uh, which also means that we, uh, which, which, is, which is, when you think about it for a second, a very profound statement, because it also means that we uh, cannot, we are not masters of our own meaning, masters of our own identity. We don't create our own identity. Instead, we derive it from our relationship to God. Uh, third, we, this also means that we have inherent value apart from any abilities or achievements of our own. Um, we have uh, incredible self-worth uh, by the very virtue of the fact that we are made in the image of God, which is something that we, uh, we don't achieve. It's not something that we earn. It's not something uh, that, we, that we have to amass uh, within the course of our lives. It has nothing to do with our abilities. It is simply what we are, what we have been created to be. And uh, then lastly, we looked a lot last week at the centuries of speculation about uh, what it means, you know, how, how exactly we resemble God. Um, and we saw that uh, there's been a lot of valuable speculation about this uh, for, for literally centuries, but uh, most of the various ideas out there haven't actually started by examining what the words image and likeness mean in uh, their biblical and historical context, particularly in the context of Genesis 1 and 2. And so that's what we're going to concentrate on today. Um, you can transition, Nathaniel. Thanks. So this week, we will, um, we're going to concentrate on Genesis 1 and 2, not 3 so much. That'll be next week. But when we look at Genesis 1 through 3 in light of both the whole canon of Scripture and other ancient literature surrounding Genesis 1 through 3, we learn that being made in the image and likeness of God means seems to mean three things. That we are God's children, that we are meant to rule like God over creation, and that we are meant to represent God within his creation and so illuminate all of creation with his glory. Uh, we are God's children, we are meant to rule like God, and we are meant to represent God. So that's kind of where we're going today. But uh, to start off, um, if we're going to talk about the image of God within the context of Genesis 1 through 2, I need to say a little bit about what that context is. And so we'll, uh, we'll start there. Um, Go ahead and transition. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, when we look at Genesis 1, if we've ever read Genesis 1 before, you start to realize pretty quickly that it is a, whatever it is, it's a highly structured account. And uh, there are lots of ways that we can see this. I've listed just a few on your handout, and I'll go through just a few here. Uh, but for one thing, uh, we know that creation takes place over seven days. 
If we look closer at these seven days, though, we see that the first six days actually fall into logical pairs. Uh, day one and day four correspond to each other. Two and five correspond to each other. Three and six correspond to each other. So in day one, light and dark are separated. In day four, uh, lights are created in the sky. Day two, water is separated. Uh, and day five, the waters are filled with their hosts, with, with living creatures. Day three, dry land appears. And on day six, the land produces land creatures. So you can kind of look at the relationship between those days as you know, days one, two, and three are days of, uh, of things being made, um, light, uh, waters, uh, land, and on the corresponding days four, five, and six, each of those things is filled with something. Uh, the, the heavens are filled with their hosts. In other words, the, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Uh, the waters are filled with their creatures. The land is filled with creatures. And then at the end of all that, of course, uh, God rests. All is finished on day seven. So day seven stands alone, stands apart. But it's evident just from the breakdown of the seven days of creation that uh, this account of creation is, is very structured. Um, and there's even more to it. Uh, beyond the fact that there are seven days, the, the phrase, uh, and God saw uh, that such and such was good, appears seven times in the text, in verses 4, 10, 12, 18, 21, 25, and 31. Um, also in Hebrew, this doesn't work in the English text, but in the Hebrew text, the first verse of Genesis is exactly seven words, and the second verse is exactly 14 words. Now, the pattern doesn't necessarily continue. That would eventually get to be really cumbersome. Um, you'd have to have some very long sentences, but it can't be an accident that in an account that is um, so concerned with the number seven that our first verse actually has seven words and our second verse has 14 words. Um, and so, so it's, it's obvious from an, in a number of different ways that whatever this is, it's a very structured account. And so um, more and more scholars have described Genesis 1 as actually a liturgy. Uh, it's a liturgy. And uh, whatever else it is, it, it seems to be uh, composed in a liturgical way. So it's a text actually in some way meant for worship. A second point that scholars have recognized about Genesis 1 is that Genesis 1 appears to describe the creation of a temple. In other words, creation is God's temple. And uh, we can see this in a few different ways. A lot has been written comparing Genesis 1 to uh, temple creation texts from the ancient Near East. So we're talking about other civilizations, other cultures that were surrounding Israel in the ancient world. Um, I've given you a bibliography at the end of this handout, and so uh, I've referenced three authors there that uh, have said a lot about this. There are others as well. But, um, but, but it becomes obvious if we compare Genesis to these other texts that Genesis really is involved in describing the creation of a temple. So when we read the story of creation in Genesis 1, we are, uh, if, we were, if we were people from its original time period, we would probably also recognize that it is describing uh, God's, God's creation as God's temple, his holy temple. Uh, this is also supported later on by Exodus 39 and 40, where we see the building of the tabernacle, and God gives the instructions for the building of the tabernacle. The building of the tabernacle, that many scholars have also uh, pointed out, uh, is actually meant to be a reflection of the created order. Every part of the tabernacle somehow symbolizes the cosmos, somehow uh, symbolizes God's created order. And this is also true later on of the temple when we get to 1 Kings 8. You can also see some reflection. Uh, so so the, the link there is that uh, just as um, creation appears to be God's temple in Genesis 1, later on when we actually get to the building of the tabernacle and then the temple, um, the reverse is true. Um, they are meant to reflect creation. 
We see the same idea a little bit um, in uh, Paul's, uh, Paul's um, speech in Athens. Um, and uh, Acts 17, 24 through 26, when Paul, uh, his, his rationale for why God does not need a temple built by human hands is in effect that all of creation is God's temple. Uh, that's that's his, his logic. God doesn't need a temple built by hands because all of creation is already his temple. So you see a little bit of a reflection of that idea of creation as God's temple there in Paul's sermon as well. So what we learned from all this, um, I just summarized uh, a, a huge amount of scholarly literature and a few bullet points, but uh, what we learned from all of this is that the fundamental purpose of creation is worship. It's, it's a really remarkable thing when you think about it that scripture actually begins with worship, begins with a liturgy. Uh, some scholars have even, even though it's not formal poetry, some scholars have said it's, it's almost like a hymn. Um, and so we begin with a worship text in, uh, in Genesis 1. And, and, the, and the purpose of all of God's creation, if, if creation is God's temple, then its purpose has to do with worship. Um, so when we get then to the creation of human beings in Genesis 1, 26 through 31, you can go ahead and look at that text. Uh, Nathaniel, if you want to transition. Thanks. Um, when we get to this text and we read, uh, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let, him, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. When we read these three verses, um, the creation of human beings is, is really the climax of God's activity in Genesis 1. This is evident in a few ways. For one thing, the, the Hebrew verb bara, meaning create, occurs three times in quick succession in Genesis 1.27. And I've underlined those there, but, um, but that's one of the ways in which Genesis is pointing us to the fact that this is the climax of God's creative activity. And then in verse 31, when God reflects on all of creation, he pronounces it this time not just good, but very good. So another indication that we really have the climax of um, God's creative activity here with human beings. And, um, and so another thing then that we see uh, when we look at these verses is that uh, human beings are more directly related to God than the rest of creation is. Um, all of creation obviously has its, ex ex its existence from God, but it's really striking that when, if we look at uh, the text closely in the language that it uses, um, in Genesis, in, in most of uh, the days of creation, starting in Genesis 1.11, uh, we read something like, um, you know, God says, let such and such produce such and such according to its kind. So for example, Genesis 1.11, and God said, let the earth sprout vegetation plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. Um, and that pattern continues throughout the days of creation. Everything is, it's continually said, let blank produce blank according to its kind. Something different happens when we get to Genesis 1.26. Instead, God says, let us referring to himself, let us make humankind in our image. Um, not let blank produce blank according to its kind, but let us make humankind in our image um, after our likeness. And uh, so one deduction that we can take from this um, in comparison to the rest of creation is that we are God's kind. Um, and this is part of what it means to be made.
in his image. Um, whereas everything else produces according to its kind, we are, um, by God's intention, his kind. Um, and we'll flesh out a little bit more of what that means as we go on. Um, and then finally, uh, in God's design, we see in... Um, also, let me pause for a minute. I need to back up. Um, quick side note. This isn't in the notes, but I know that um, it's a question that people will rightly have. It's a really good question. Um, what is going on there in Genesis 1.26? Uh, why does God refer to himself in the plural? Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Um, there have been a lot of theories uh, over the years. So, of course, one speculation that uh, Christians have had um, since the days of the Church Fathers is that uh, this is a reference to the Trinity. Uh, God refers to himself in the plural because he is, in fact, Trinitarian, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, of course, others will point out that uh, that's difficult because um, the Trinity had not been revealed, although God is in fact a triune God that had not yet been revealed at the time when Genesis was written. And as, how would the authors have known that? How, how could this be a reference to the Trinity um, before the Trinity was revealed? Uh, and so other explanations have been proposed over the years. One is that God is speaking to the angels here. But that seems kind of odd because how can God be, if he's speaking to the angels when he says us and our, uh, then does that mean that we're made in the uh, image of God and the angels? It doesn't really work. I mean, how can we be simultaneously made in the image of God and the image of the angels? That's two different things. Uh, so it seems unlikely that he's um, speaking to the angels when he says this. Um, uh, another uh, possible explanation that's been proposed over the years is that uh, this is uh, what is sometimes called a, um, a plural of majesty. So um, and it's kings and kings and queens, royalty, have often in um, medieval times and, and even more recent times than that uh, referred to themselves in the plural. Um, a, a king might refer to himself as we, um, what's known as uh, the plural of majesty. Uh, so uh, on the face of it, that it seems like it's uh, a possibility. The problem is that as far as we know, um, Hebrew had no such thing. Um, there, there's just no such thing as a plural of majesty in ancient Hebrew. At least if there is, it's um, really interesting that we've never seen it anywhere else. And so in all of the narratives of the kings that we have later on in scripture, never once do we see a plural of majesty. Um, if it existed, then why haven't we seen it anywhere else but potentially here? So uh, that doesn't seem to be a very good explanation. And uh, the long and short of it is that while it may seem unlikely uh, in, some, in some respects that God is uh, literally referring to uh, himself in the plural, referring to a plurality of persons um, here, it's, it, it's really uh, what we're almost forced to say in the end. Every other explanation that has ever been tried eventually fails. Um, and so... Uh, I've, and so I was reading uh, one, I was actually reading uh, a little bit of commentary by a Messianic Jewish scholar um, who basically came to the same conclusion that you uh, are ultimately um, forced to say that he is referring to um, a plurality of persons within himself. I, um, and I liked what one church father said. Uh, one church father said the uh, acknowledged that of course uh, the Trinity had not been revealed to the author of Genesis yet um, but the way that one church father put it was uh, God winked when he inspired the author um, to speak of him in the plural here um, and uh, knowing what was coming um, down the road um, knowing in fact that he was Trinitarian even if the author didn't know that um, and um, 
Uh, so it, at the end of the day, it's a difficult issue. One other thing to support the idea that he could be referring to himself in the plural here um, is that uh, a plurality of persons, that is, is that we have already seen reference to the spirit in Genesis 1-2. Um, so there's that possibility. We've already seen um, God and God's spirit uh, mentioned in Genesis. And so uh, that might support the idea that there's a plurality of persons um, in Genesis 1-26. Um, so uh, tentatively, I, I think that's um, where I would fall, and because it's the best explanation that I know of, um, most of the others, as I said, uh, don't work out if you follow them through. Um, it's significant because it also means that when God creates us in his image, uh, he creates us, God, God is a relational God. He has relationship within himself by virtue of being Trinitarian. Um, and uh, when he creates us in our image, uh, then it becomes possible to see how his relationality becomes a part of us as well. We are relational creatures because he is a relational God. Um, and, okay, that's, so that's the side note, um, a big side note. But, um, but back, to, uh, back to Genesis 128 then. God's ultimate design here is for human beings to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And um, when, we, when we think about what, uh, what human beings are so far, what we know um, that they are supposed to reflect uh, God in some way, mirror him within creation, that we are somehow or another God's kind, that we are uh, in some way the climax of his uh, creative activity in Genesis 1, this idea then that we are then supposed to multiply and fill the earth uh, gives us this picture of a multiplication of God's image uh, within creation. Um, and so our multiplication as the image of God would ultimately mean filling creation with God's own uh, image, in other words, his glory. That's the vision here for human beings, is that as we are fruitful, as we multiply and fill the earth in doing so, um, we will be filling the earth with the image of God's glory. That's how it was supposed to work in Genesis 1, through 28. And so you can then compare this to what we see um, later in scripture. Uh, it, this, is, this is almost analogous to um, the filling of the temple with the glory of the Lord. Um, in Exodus 40, 34, later um, with the temple in 1 Kings 8, 10, and 11, we see this language of God's holy temple being filled with the glory of the Lord. And that seems to be exactly what human beings were uh, purposed toward in Genesis 1, through 28. If creation is his temple, we were meant to fill the temple with the glory of the Lord by, by multiplying in his image. And so we see here that just as creation's chief purpose is worship, um, our chief purpose, too, has to do with the worship of God. Not only are we created um, to worship God, but we are also instrumental to the worship of God that was intended to take place in creation itself because we, um, we glorify the Lord by illuminating his creation uh, with his image. Um, that's the vision uh, in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Um, so uh, going on a little bit further, going a little bit deeper then, uh, what do we learn when we look in depth at the words image and likeness? Um, what do these words seem to mean elsewhere in the canon of scripture, for instance? Um, we actually learn quite a lot. A lot of study has been done in this area in the last couple decades, especially. And it has been pointed out, uh, first of all, I should say, these two terms, image and likeness, um, there's been a lot of discussion about whether they are synonymous or whether they refer to two different things. And the short answer seems to be that while they are not always synonymous, they do appear to be synonymous um, here, more or less synonymous in Genesis 1, through 28. Uh, that's been the conclusion of most scholars throughout the history of the church. 
and um, ultimately image is a slightly more concrete term in Hebrew, uh, tselem in Hebrew. Uh, likeness is uh, a more abstract term, but used together as they are here in Genesis 126 and in a couple other places, um, they appear to be more or less synonymous. Um, but the governing term really is, you can kind of look at image as the governing term and likeness as a supporting term um, in these verses. And uh, so when we, when we look at the rest of the uh, canon of scripture, what is very striking is that, and kind of alarming, um, this may be shocking to us actually, is that uh, Tselem and its Aramaic equivalent found in Daniel um, usually denote idols or graven images. Um, and in fact, every single use of this word in the Old Testament outside Genesis is negative, is pejorative. Um, and um, and so uh, this is also true, by the way, there are a couple synonyms of, uh, of Selim, also translated image in the Old Testament, and they are also universally um, negative in, uh, in the Old Testament. So it's only in the first few chapters of Genesis that we ever see this term used positively in the Old Testament. And that's when it's used of human beings created, primarily when it's used of human beings created in God's image. So uh, recently, um, an Old Testament scholar named Catherine McDowell, who um, now teaches at my alma mater, Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, before that taught at Wheaton, um, has written a dissertation uh, where she has further shown that these two terms, image and likeness, are primarily used in three contexts in the ancient literature uh, from the cultures surrounding Israel. So we find, we find the same terminology, image and likeness, uh, used in texts from all sorts of other cultures, um, especially Egyptian and Babylonian um, surrounding Israel. And when these terms are used, they tend to refer to three things. They denote three things. Um, kinship, um, being made in the image and likeness of someone can, er, or bearing the image and likeness of someone can mean that you are akin to them, you are family with them. Um, another is kingship. Uh, image and likeness language was used to refer to kings. Um, uh, particularly in being in the image and likeness of um, a deity in uh, the ancient world. And, um, and thirdly, uh, we, see th we see them used in, in religious or worship contexts uh, where image and likeness refer again to, um, to idols or graven images. Um, and uh, so again, a lot of what we find here is initially a little bit alarming to us, and so I want to be real careful here. Um, Catherine McDowell goes on to demonstrate uh, that in various ways each of these nuances seem to be present in Genesis 1 and 2 as well, uh, with some twists, which are very important. Uh, I want to be very careful here to say that while there is a comparison to be made um, between human beings and the image of God, and uh, image in many other contexts, um, all of its other contexts in the Old Testament referring to idols. Um, uh, in no way um, is Genesis suggesting that we are deities ourselves or that we in, at any point become deified. Um, and when we get to Genesis 3 next week, we'll see exactly how strongly Genesis refutes that idea and actually takes hold of that idea that was found in pagan cultures and turns it on its head um, and shows how that is exactly not the case in reality. That may be how various cultures, pagan cultures around Israel conceived of things um, uh, with their idolatrous worship, um, but, uh, but Genesis 1 through 3 is ultimately going to tell us that that's a perversion of uh, God's actual design. Uh, nevertheless, there is a little bit of an analogy um, that, will, um, that will play out here. 
And uh, so how do we see these three things? How do we see kinship, kingship, and worship reflected um, uh, by human beings in Genesis 1 and 2? Um, well, and by the way, what I'm doing in this page is summarizing an entire uh, Old Testament PhD dissertation. So, so you're just getting the nuts and bolts. Um, but uh, the actual book is in the bibliography if you, um, if you really want to torture yourself. Um, so, uh, so first, human beings as God's children in Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, I've already pointed out that relationality seems to be expressed in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Uh, first of all, God, uh, God refers to himself in the plural, so when he creates us in his image, it makes sense to think that something of his own relationality has been imprinted on us. Um, again, it's significant that we are created, that uh, human beings are created male and female, uh, already created as a pair when they are created in his image. Um, in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Uh, later, in Genesis 2, uh, we see this language used where, uh, where Adam refers to Eve um, as bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Uh, Genesis 2, 23, then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Um, and we think of those of that language, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, generally in the context of marriage. But actually, if we look at uh, where that same kind of language shows up elsewhere in scripture, we see that uh, it does indeed refer to family relationships, kinship, but it's not really restricted to marriage. Uh, bone of my bone or flesh of my flesh, either one of those two terms can be used elsewhere in the Old Testament. Uh, to refer to any sort of family relationships, cousins, uh, brothers and sisters, um, whatever it may be. Uh, it's simply a way of saying that you are my kind. We are family. We are, uh, we are the same. Um, we are fami familially linked. And, um, and so uh, while it's not necessarily expressing kinship with God, it is maybe significant that bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh begins to express that idea of kin kinship, um, the language of kinship, very early in the human story. Um, in other words, we're already beginning to reflect um, and play out that relationality that was imprinted on us in uh, Genesis 1, through 28. But the biggest clue, actually, that uh, the terms image and likeness in Genesis really can refer to kinship occurs in Genesis 5.3. Uh, Nathaniel, if you'll transition. Um, Genesis 5.3 refers to, to the relationship between Adam and his son Seth. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his own image and named him Seth. And so there, uh, we're referring to a liter the literal son of a father, and the image of, uh, and the language of image and likeness are being used to describe uh, that relationship. So it's clear in Genesis the image and likeness really can refer to uh, kinship, or in this case, sonship. Um, and so one meaning of being made in God's image is probably that we are His children. Um, we resemble him uh, as children resemble uh, a parent. And so that's one, one aspect of being made in his image. Um, another, uh, the second then, uh, human beings as God's vice regents or as his royal representatives. Um, in Genesis 1, through 28, we also see that God creates human beings to uh, specifically to have dominion and to subdue the earth. Um, if we compare this to Psalm, um, if we compare this to Psalm 8, if you can go one more slide, thanks. Um, it, Psalm 8 uh, has been identified by many scholars as a sort of commentary on the creation of human beings in Genesis and reflects a lot of the same language that we find there in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. 
So if you compare Psalm 8, 5, and 6, for instance, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Um, we have a lot of royal language being used here, crowning, uh, putting all things under his feet, um, referring to the creation of uh, human beings again. And so already in Genesis, we have some of this language, um, have dominion, subdue the earth. Uh, it's played out again um, a little bit further in Psalm 8. Um, and so it seems that that is one of the functions of human beings created in the image of God, that we are meant to rule over the earth in some way. And now, uh, when we hear the word subdue, um, the word subdue is often, uh, often has negative connotations to us, and it can be negative in scripture as well. Sometimes it is. Uh, but it can also mean, uh, in a more neutral or even positive sense, to bring something uh, into order, uh, to bring something into, into order in order to make it more beautiful or more productive. Uh, so you can think of this kind of like mowing the lawn or, or weeding a garden. In some way, when you mow your lawn or weed a garden, um, you are subduing, um, literally subduing the earth. Um, and, uh, and so if we think of subdue in that way, it's not so much um, ruling over things in a tyrannical sense, dominating things, as, uh, as it is caring for things, um, bringing things into order in order to make them more beautiful or productive. Um, in fact, gardening is a common metaphor for kingship uh, in the ancient Near East. If we look again at some of the broader ancient literature out there, we find that kings are often described as gardeners. And it's perhaps not by accident that Adam is, uh, seems to be a gardener or farmer um, in, um, in Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, it's actually a metaphor of kingship in the ancient world. Um, and so you can think of this as God effectively making us managers over his creation. The creation belongs to him, but he's given it to us to manage. Um, and the idea is that we should manage it well, manage it as he would manage it, um, and, and care for it. Uh, we are supposed to be stewards, in other words, and cultivators. Um, this is what it means to rule as God would rule over creation, to be stewards and cultivators of what he has given, um, to take what he has given, to care for it, and to make the absolute most of it that we can. Um, then lastly, human beings as God's representation. Um, so we've already seen that uh, Genesis 1 is a temple liturgy, a liturgy describing the creation of a temple. We've also seen that uh, the creation of human beings in God's image is the climax of that liturgy. And we've seen that the word selim, image, uh, most often refers to an idol or, or graven image of a, of a god, a religious image. In God's creation temple, it seems that human beings are um, meant to be the image that represents God himself with the twist that whereas in many ancient cultures there would be some ceremony eventually where you, uh, where you actually deified um, the idol, that does not happen with human beings. Um, we you know, we may be um, images meant to represent him, to represent his likeness in creation, um, but we are still uh, uh, definitely um, removed from him. We are separate from him, uh, and there is a firm line that cannot be crossed between being God and being in God's image. Uh, we'll see that more next week. Um, but one thing this tells us then is that our final purpose is actually to bear his image um, within creation so as to fill creation with his likeness. Um, these are the things that we were ultimately meant to do. Um, and so I'm going to open the floor for questions in just a second. 
Um, but uh, I want to just note three practical implications that we can take away from this. Um, one is that um, you are God's child, which means that you are dear to him. Um, if, if being made in the image and likeness of God means that we are God's children, then part of what it means is that we were created in and for love. Uh, secondly, we are meant to cultivate whatever God has given to us, whatever he has put before us. And that could, be, and that could mean anything from the environment to your own family, um, our, um, our spouses, our, our brothers and sisters, our parents for that matter, uh, our children, um, your neighbor. Um, and, and this could even include creative pursuits. Um, what it will mean will depend a little bit, will differ from person to person. Uh, but what has, the question for us to ask ourselves is what has God put before us? What has he given to us that we are to steward and to cultivate? Uh, doing that well is part of what it means to be made in the image of God. Thirdly, uh, we are meant to show the whole world in some way what God is like, which means exemplifying his own goodness. Ultimately, uh, to in order, if we, if we are meant to resemble God, to bear his likeness within creation, there's no way we can do that apart from exhibiting his character. Um, and so uh, we are meant to exemplify uh, that character um, and show others uh, what God is like. You can compare this a little bit to um, Jesus in Sermon on the Mount. Uh, uh, commanding us that we are supposed to be salt and light in the earth. It's a similar idea. And I'm going to stop there. There's more that I could say, um, but I'd rather leave a few minutes for questions. So let me just go ahead and open up the floor. How about that? There okay. First of all, great. I really enjoyed this. I do have a question for you is, in the time when Genesis was written, even today, a lot of times we don't think of kings as being benevolent and nurturing and cultivating. So why do you think this role of a king is used so much when it has, even back then, so many negative connotations? Uh, great question, and so I certainly want to say more about that uh, next week when we get to s uh, when we when we see how how all of this goes wrong in the fall. Um, but um, but it seems that if, I mean, so you're right. We we are familiar, and they were familiar with even back then um, kings as tyrants, kings as anything but benevolent. Um, and yet God himself describes himself as a king and a benevolent and a compassionate king. And it seems there that what we are familiar with, unfortunately, is the perversion of um, what was supposed to be. Um, and, um, and what we have to recover is, is the benevolent image um, rather than the, the fallen tyrannical image. Um, any other questions? I missed why you said um, you used humankind rather than male and female. Uh, I'm trying to think at what point. Um, When I printed it up there, you mean? Okay, um, so I, there are a couple, so part of it's a translation issue. Um, I don't think I ever, if, if I did, it was an accident, but I don't think I ever meant to change male and female to humankind. Um, but um, there are places where, 
you know, the ESV, for instance, will translate um, man. Um, but it's really referring to man in the sense of humankind, which is, you know, in, in the English language, that's one of the uses of the word man. Um, but, uh, but you could just as easily translate that humankind, which I did just to avoid um, confusion. It's not talking about man as in uh, a male gendered organism there. It's just talking about a human being. Um, and, um, and then later uh, expands that by saying both male and female. So, um, When we were talking about God talking about creating in the plural, like let us, um, we've also like read about how Jesus is the word of God. So is he present at the creation? Even, yeah. Um, great question. So I can just answer that with a straightforward yes. Um, not necessarily on the basis of uh, Genesis 1. Um, we don't you know, explicitly uh, see Jesus in Genesis 1. But by the time we get to John chapter 1, we see John reflecting on Genesis 1 and identifying uh, Jesus as the very word by which God spoke creation into existence. And so in the overall, um, you know, further on down the road, I would say, yes, Jesus is present here in Genesis 1. Um, and that just isn't revealed until later in Scripture. So. Any other Time for maybe one more. Okay, well, I should probably end here. Uh, and I want to say, um, again, please be thinking of whatever questions you have, questions that may occur to you afterward uh, on further reflection. And uh, in two weeks, not next week, but in two weeks, I want to devote the entire session really to discussion. And I'm happy to um, chase down any questions that you all bring to me. So email those to me now um, or whenever. Um, and I will try to keep track of uh, all the questions that come in. Uh, so thank you. <laughs>